I, th I thought it was important before we jump into the discussion about the Greenpoint Williamsburg waterfront is to, to go back a few decades and talk about the context that we come out of. Because I, I think if you think broadly about what Greenpoint Williamsburg, the waterfront there represents, and, and where a lot of the focus has been in our housing uh, and more broadly our sustainability efforts, it is an enormous shift from where we've been in the city over the last few decades, and in particular around our housing efforts. So I, I do want to talk about that history and the context a little bit, and then come, by come back and talk specifically about the plan for the waterfront and where, where it's headed. Um, this slide, for those of you that don't recognize it, is probably the most famous street in the history of urban revitalization in, in the US. This is Charlotte Street in the South Bronx. And what you see in the background, um, these five and six story uh, tenement buildings, is the context of what uh, Charlotte Street looked like in 1977 when Jimmy Carter, then president, uh, came to visit Charlotte Street, compared it to Dresden after World War II, and declared a new urban policy for, for the U.S., that he would take uh, HUD and urban policy in a new direction to try and rebuild the South Bronx and so many neighborhoods across the country like it. This was also the street that, uh, that uh, then candidate for President Ronald Reagan visited in 1980 to declare uh, Jimmy Carter's urban policy a failure, and that he would bring the private market back to the South Bronx. Um, 1977, if you remember, was the year that Howard Cosell declared, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning, as the Yankees were, were playing the World Series. There were literally hundreds of buildings across the South Bronx that, that burned in arson and uh, were, were abandoned. What you see in the forefront here is the very first efforts at revitalization in the South Bronx, Charlotte Gardens. And, and the story goes that these houses were shipped in in the middle of the night by the Mid-Bronx Desperados, um, a, a community group that we still work with, and placed on these sites because they were fighting with the city about whether, in fact, this development should go forward. And the main reason I, I, I show you this, other than the context around what was happening in the city, um, was where I, I think all of us uh, interested in the city's future were, thought the city would go. I mean, here you have a, a, a group that was actually trying to rebuild this neighborhood that in the range of opinions about where the South Bronx was headed and the city more broadly was probably optimistic. Um, believing that the South Bronx should be rebuilt basically as Levittown, single family houses on quarter acre lots. And fundamentally, the outlook was that we would never regain the population and the vitality, perhaps, that, that the South Bronx had had at, at one point. And you see you know, five and six story buildings, the most dense, second most dense place in, in all of New York City after Manhattan being rebuilt on this kind of scale. This, pot, this neighborhood lost, during the 1970s, about 75% of its population. Next slide. These maps, which uh, I'm sure you can't see the details from the back of the room, but over here on the left, this is Harlem, and on the right is the South Bronx. These two neighborhoods were, were representative of what happened during that period more broadly in the city. All of those red dots that you see, or, or shapes, were properties that, through tax foreclosure, my agency, HPD, took over. Uh, we became owners around the city of more than 100,000 apartments and roughly 10,000 vacant lots. At one point, we owned 60% of the private real estate in Harlem. Think about that. Now, this really represents not just the crisis that we were experiencing at that time. Owners literally uh, were burning down their buildings because it was the only way to, to have any value in them, to collect insurance, um, or they were just abandoning them to the city, not paying their taxes, and we were taking them over in ownership. This represented the crisis of that time, but also really became the opportunity for New York City's housing policy for the decades to come, really right up to the time that Mayor Bloomberg came into office. Uh, 
Because what, what the city began doing is taking these buildings, putting in literally billions of dollars of city capital, your taxpayer dollars, and renovating these buildings, and turning them over to private nonprofit or local for-profit ownership um, to be run as affordable housing, or we're taking vacant lots and running competitions to develop them as affordable housing. And this really became the housing policy for the city over the next few decades. Next slide. Now, I, I won't claim that uh, the housing policies and turning these buildings around had everything to do with turning around the fortunes of the South Bronx and more broadly, a dramatic change in, in the decline in population that we saw during the 1970s. But what you see on this chart is that there was a dramatic turnaround. And I do think the housing policies of that time really did contribute to it, along with policing strategies, uh, strategies to turn around schools, a whole range of things that began to bring people back to New York City. But, but what you see is that after an enormous decline, uh, overall in the city, about 800,000 people were lost from New York City's population in the 1970s. That's more than losing the entire city of Boston or the entire city of Washington, D.C. from our population. After that, what you see is from 1980, a steady climb back in our population. And in 2000, what you reach is a real landmark that prior to 2000, our city's record high population was in 1970, just over 8 million people. In 2000, we surpassed that number for the first time in the city's history. And since then, our population has continued to climb. And we expect to add another million people to New York City by the year 2030. And that was really what was behind the mayor's uh, Plan YC, a plan for how do we grow the city by a million people by the year, the year 2030, while at the same time cutting carbon emissions by 30%. All 127 recommendations, which I'm not going to cover tonight, um, that are in that plan, are part of a, an overall strategy to grow the city by a million people while cutting carbon emissions by 30%. Next. So with that framework, I want to talk about um, how housing fits into it, and, and fundamentally how our housing strategies had to change dramatically from uh, the prior strategies where we were really focusing on taking these tax foreclosed properties, either buildings or vacant land, and using them as our foundation for creating affordable housing. Next. What the mayor did when he came into office is to put together an affordable housing plan, which was very, very large in scale and in resources, but was also very different in terms of the strategies. Um, originally, it was a five-year, $3 billion plan to create or preserve 65,000 units of affordable housing. It was expanded um, soon uh, before he was reelected for a second term to a 10-year, 165,000 unit plan um, that would create or preserve enough affordable housing for 500,000 New Yorkers, a $7.5 billion plan. But I think just as importantly as those resources, the name of the plan was the New Housing Marketplace. And it's important because we had gone from a situation, again, remember uh, the, that first slide in the South Bronx, we'd gone from a situation where the city really had to recreate a housing market in, in these areas, where private capital was never going to go in on its own without a, an enormous investment of time and resources by the city. We were really driving a housing market in those areas to today where the market has returned to these neighborhoods. The real question is, how do we work with the market? How do we harness the market, if you will, to continue to create and preserve affordable housing in a very dis different environment? At the same time, where we've literally almost run out of those tax foreclosed properties that we took over, that I showed you earlier in Harlem and the South Bronx. Literally today, we have less than 1,000 units left from those more than 100,000 units we started with. And that's great news. It's an incredible success story in turning around those neighborhoods and those buildings. At the same time, it leaves us really wondering where are our resources? Where is our land? 
where our building is going to come from to be able to continue to create affordable housing in the future. And that's the context that's so important in terms of this discussion for Greenpoint Williamsburg. And there were four primary strategies that we needed to advance to be able to be successful. The first was to find new land for affordable housing. We were running out of that tax foreclosed land in the buildings. We had to figure out both with other government agencies that might have land, the housing authority and a whole range of others, but also to look to the private sector, to the gentleman you see to my, to my right, to privately own land to be able to figure out how to have new strategies to create affordable housing there with, with privately owned land. We also had to think about incentives to serve different groups of people. A at one end of the spectrum, we've learned a lot about how to end chronic homelessness, and supportive housing in particular became an increasingly important part of our plans to reach the lowest income New Yorkers. At the same time, more and more middle class New Yorkers were struggling given the strength of the housing market, given rising costs, rising rents, rising sale prices, more and more middle class New Yorkers were struggling to find affordable housing. So we had to come up with new strategies for that income group as well. Third, we had to figure out how to harness the private market, and I talked about this earlier. How do we go from a situation where the private market is working against us, making housing less and less affordable because we don't have enough supply to keep up with demand, with all the new people coming to New York City, how do we think about it in a strategy to actually use the strength of the market to be able to create affordable housing? And inclusionary housing, which I'm going to come back to in my presentation, is one of the most important uh, of those strategies that I think will demonstrate what I'm talking about there. And then finally, we had to look again at lots of the affordable housing we created in earlier generations, housing like Michelama housing, that frankly was not at risk 20 years ago. If you look at Michelama housing in the Bronx, in Harlem, in many of the neighborhoods that I talked about, none of us were concerned that we'd see a day where rents had gone up so much that we would be concerned about those owners wanting to buy out of the programs and convert those properties to market rate. As we all know, that story is very different today. And we had to come up with new strategies to try to preserve that existing subsidized housing, government-assisted housing, to make sure that we maintained it as affordable housing for future generations. Those, so those were the four primary strategies we had to pursue. <coughs> Next. And so we come to Greenpoint Williamsburg. And, and part of this story of having lost uh, uh, close to a million people in population and then grown again, and, and really to be a city looking forward to a larger population than we'd ever seen in our history, we had to start rethinking our land use policies and areas where uh, we could develop new residential communities uh, that, were, that were great sort of places of opportunity for, for the city. And so Greenpoint Williamsburg is one of the prime examples of that, but not the only example. Areas like West Chelsea and, and Hudson Yards in, in, in Manhattan, uh, areas like Jamaica in, uh, in Queens, uh, and lots of other areas, areas in the South Bronx and others, formerly industrial areas where there was potential for new residential zoning. And here what you see in Greenpoint Williamsburg two miles of continuous waterfront that at the time we started the rezoning had only one <laughs> active industrial uh, business left, Domino Sugar, which then, while we were working on the rezoning, closed down. Two miles of what was once the most productive industrial area in, in the city, the largest sugar plant in the world, the largest rope manufacturing plant in the world, none of that industry remaining. Um, and yet, that had really been true for more than a decade, no comprehensive plan to rethink what that waterfront could be and what it would look like. Here what you see is the zoning map that was created for the plan, um, and really what you see is very two very distinct areas. The waterfront zoning, which we're going to spend most of our time on, um, that included uh, higher density residential, uh, towers up to 40 stories um, along the waterfront, uh, major new park development here, as well as a plan for a continuous two-mile esplanade along the water to make sure that there was public access to the waterfront. Um, when we began, there was absolutely no way to get to that waterfront because it was all industrial, uh, inaccessible to the, to the public. 
And then a very different strategy in the upland area of Greenpoint and Williamsburg, where a lot of the concern was about out-of-scale development going up. There were no height limits in most of this area. And so the rezoning actually imposed, for the first time, height limits in those areas while also trying to blend both in this area and this purple area here, maintaining uh, industrial and uh, commercial zoning where there was still viable active industrial build businesses left. And in fact, this area here was protected as an industrial business zone. Um, the city basically said, we are committing that we will not rezone this area here as residential to protect the industrial business that was not only existing, but was in fact growing in that area. Next. Um, I, I want to now turn to inclusionary housing. And there's, I, I don't want to bore you here with a sort of housing wonk discussion of, of the details of housing and zoning policy, but I do think it's important to talk a little bit of, about this strategy, because I think it's the best example of how we shifted our strategies to try to work with the private market. Inclusionary housing or inclusionary zoning I is fairly simple. It's a deal that we make with private developers to say, if you're going to develop a, a market rate, a 100% market rate building, we'll let you build, and in this case, I'll come back to the Greenpoint Williamsburg waterfront example, we'll let you build 30 stories. But if you are willing to include at least 20% of your floor area, which is typically higher than 20% of the units, as affordable housing, we'll allow you to go higher, to, to build at a higher density, and to go, in this case, up to 40 stories um, in, in those buildings. And what you get as a result of that, because of the strength of the market, the value of those extra stories that you're allowing in the building, you get a significant financial incentive for that private developer to add affordable housing in what would otherwise be 100% market rate development. So it's a strategy to get affordable housing on privately owned land. At the same time, more br if you think about it more broadly, it's a strategy to make sure that as we're building what are essentially new neighborhoods on the waterfront in Greenpoint Williamsburg and in lots of other neighborhoods, that from the very beginning we build in the economic diversity that is so important to the economic success and future of New York City. We've got to make sure as housing prices are rising that we retain opportunities for low and moderate income workers to remain in the city. But it also retains the kind of vitality in New York City that I think we all love about New York. We realize more and more as we become a global economic uh, uh, power and, and compete with cities around, around the country, uh, around the world, that more and more what is going to continue to attract people to New York is not becoming a city of purely rich and poor, uh, a, a city that doesn't have room for vital mixed income neighborhoods. We've got to figure out strategies to build that diversity into neighborhoods from the very beginning. And so uh, inclusionary zoning is a critical part of a strategy to make sure that Greenpoint Will Williamsburg and lots of other neighborhoods that are getting developed um, on indu formerly industrial areas are built from the very beginning as mixed income communities. And I think that's absolutely critical. The way that inclusionary zoning works, I talked about this trade in, in, in density. In exchange for that ex ex extra density, there is permanently affordable, and this is, I think, important, unlike Michelama and the housing that we've developed before, is a permanent requirement that it remain affordable. It can be newly constructed on site, or it can be newly constructed within that neighborhood. It can't be put in low-income neighborhoods, you know, where lots of other affordable housing was developed historically. It has to be put in the, either in the building or in the same neighborhood. Or it has to go to preserve existing affordable housing permanently in that community as well. Um, and there's one example that we're doing now in Greenpoint Williamsburg. A Catholic Charities building is being renovated, um, a, a, an SRO for formerly homeless is being renovated and will be permanently preserved as affordable housing as a result of the inclusionary zoning program in Greenpoint Williamsburg. There was, before Greenpoint Williamsburg, there was an existing inclusionary zoning program, but it was only available in the very densest neighborhoods in Manhattan. 
This was the very first time that the city had ever proposed and gotten past inclusionary zoning in one of the other boroughs besides Manhattan. It was also the very first time we'd ever used it in anything less than the very, very highest density neighborhood. So what we have in, in the, particularly the upland area of Greenpoint Williamsburg, away from the water, is an inclusionary zoning program in a neighborhood where there are four, five, six story buildings. So it was a radical departure from what we've done before. We also dramatically increased the amount of affordable housing that we were requiring. Previously, it was roughly three, four, five percent of the housing that would end up as affordable in the old program. Under this program, we get a minimum of 20% of the floor area, as I said before, as affordable housing. Um, the other thing that I think is particularly important about our program, unlike lots of other cities that have used inclusionary zoning, we don't allow a developer, instead of doing the affordable housing either in the building or in the neighborhood, to pay money into a fund to be able to fulfill their obligations. We see this as a way, as I said before, to make sure that we get affordable housing built into that neighborhood, not to put money into a fund to make sure that affordable housing gets built somewhere else in the city, because we're very concerned about not concentrating all affordable housing in the lowest income communities within New York City. Next. Um, here's just a graphic uh, example of how it worked in, in Greenpoint Williamsburg. What you see here is a sort of prototypical uh, way that the zoning worked on the waterfront. And in the yellow is sort of what would, allow, would have been allowed to be developed without doing affordable housing on site. These additional eight to 10 stories were what was allowed by uh, taking the inclusionary uh, zoning deal. And ex in exchange for that roughly 27% density bonus, um, at least 20 to 25 percent of the floor area in those buildings had to be dedicated to affordable housing. And it's either 20 percent, all of it for below 80 percent of area median income. That's uh, housing wonk speak for low income. 20 percent of the units had to be set aside for low income New Yorkers. Or as an alternative, 10 percent of the floor area could be set aside for low income, and an additional 15 percent would be set aside for moderate income. Uh, or middle class. So that was how you would get to the 25% of the floor area as the minimum. So that's, that's the deal. In addition, what we did is we significantly expanded the use of our property tax incentives. We said to developers, if you do this affordable housing, we will also give you a significant break on your property taxes. But if you do the 100% market rate, we're going to change the rules and you'll get no break on your property taxes uh, whatsoever. And so that was an important part of the overall changes that we made to ensure that we got affordable housing. And as you'll, you'll hear from the other presentations, uh, the, the first buildings going up on the waterfront have taken this deal. It's working, and affordable housing is being developed. In fact, we've held a lottery and will soon be uh, renting up the very first affordable units on the waterfront in Greenpoint Williamsburg as a result of this, uh, of this strategy. No, nobody to date has turned down this deal. There are no 100% market rate buildings going up on the waterfront in Greenpoint Williamsburg as a result of the, re the rezoning. Next. Um, I'm going to skip over this just in the interest of, of time. Um, just to give you a sense of overall what's happening as a result of, of the plan, um, we have in construction um, or uh, in, in the construction pipeline, is, it should read, um, on the waterfront, about 600 affordable units that are, uh, that are moving forward. And in pipeline, I mean those are under planning with our agency. We're working with developers. We're working out the financing. But they haven't begun construction yet. We have an additional 460 units of affordable housing that are already in construction. So in total, over 1,000 units of affordable housing on the waterfront in Greenpoint Williamsburg that are either in construction or in the planning stages. In addition to that, we have about uh, 318 units in construction in the upland area, sort of the existing built neighborhood uh, that are getting developed uh, in construction, and an additional uh, over 700 units that are in the planning stages right now uh, for development. So in total, what you see is over 2,000 units of affordable housing uh, that are either in construction or in the planning stages as a result of these strategies that we developed uh, along the waterfront. 
Finally, I just want to talk a little bit about the waterfront access. I'm not uh, the, a the expert on that, but I do think it's important to talk about some of the other goals. I mentioned earlier uh, that there was a major new park being developed uh, along the waterfront. Uh, there's uh, about $100 million in city funding that's been committed to the development of this park. But in addition to that, a critical element was this two-mile continuous um, waterfront esplanade or walkway that was at least 40 feet in width that would be developed uh, project by project along, along the waterfront. So what we came up with was a, what's called a waterfront, waterfront access plan which required each of the developers working along that waterfront to set aside this space for public access. And so what you see is not just that 40-foot um, walkway along the entire waterfront, but in addition to that, you see that here, areas where it would be wider than war uh, 40 feet, um, plazas and small parks that would be developed along that waterfront as well. All of that was part of a very detailed strategy that was part of the, re the rezoning uh, that would happen. In addition to that, if there are a couple more pieces that sort of come in, one of the very critical things with this was that this not become a private space, that it not just become waterfront access for the residents of the waterfront, but that the people, existing community living in the, in the upland areas would also get access to the waterfront. And so we required that these orange areas be public streets, uh, drivable streets that would reach the waterfront so that people could walk on the sidewalks and, and get to that waterfront in many, many different locations. You see them all here along. In addition to that, the next one, what you see is these additional what are called uh, upland connections. And what that means is these are walkways that allow the public to get access. They may, they're not streets cars can't go down them, but there are walkways open to the public that allow access uh, to, to the waterfront. And those are these um, kind of darker orange uh, access points as well. In addition to flexible locations where there would be a, a broader area that would allow access, not just a walkway, um, but broader areas that would allow public access through um, other kind of public-private spaces. Um, and finally, making sure that there were visual corridors as well so that views weren't blocked by this higher density development uh, and to make sure those visual corridors were available for uh, the residents of the neighborhood as well.